I was saved three times from the chaos of life, twice Gunning Hopkins and Mrs. Hopkins, each time intervening to redirect a life spiraling down the toilet. The third rescue happened completely differently, but it has every chance of lasting a lifetime. My name is David Dare. People who know me well call me Davy. I spent 12 years of my life in foster care. I didn't know my father at all. I'm not even sure my mother even knew who fertilized her. And if she did know, she never told me or my grandmother. My mother was dependent on prohibited substances for the first six years. She was in and out of my life, although she disappeared rather than appeared baboon. For most of that time, I was cared for by my grandmother, who died shortly before I entered first grade. Leaving my care to my heroin-addicted mother. My stay under my mother's care turned out to be very short. About two months after my grandmother died, I came home from school to find my mother asleep in bed with a needle sticking out of her arm. I tried repeatedly to wake her up. Experience told me that sometimes she just needed sleep. So I waited. I ended up waiting three days, eating whatever I could find in the refrigerator and a box of cereal that I climbed onto a chair to get out of the cupboard. After I didn't show up to school for the third day in a row and my mother didn't answer her phone. Mrs. Gallagher, my first grade teacher, came to check on me with her patrolman husband when they knocked on the door. I didn't want to let them in until Mrs. Gallagher assured me that everything would be fine. I said that Mom was sleeping, and Mrs. Gallagher went to check on her, after which she called her husband. He confirmed that my mother was dead. Then they called Children and Youth Services, and they took me into foster care. Years after my experience in foster care, a woman named Naomi Schaefer Riley wrote a book called how not to treat a child. This is an indictment of the foster care system. The only thing I disagree with her conclusions is that she does not speak strongly enough about how destructive this system is for the child caught in it. Seif has made several incoherent attempts to find my relatives with whom they could place me. But if I had living relatives, I wouldn't know any of them. This was long before the craze of genetic testing and searching for relatives in various online databases became popular. So I mostly rummaged through my mother's things to see if there was a way to find out names or phone numbers. SIF has found nothing, and I went to a long-term upbringing in an extremely flawed system when I later added up the total. By the time I was 14, I had been raised by 12 different families in 9 different schools. I was not a difficult child or a rebel but some of the adoptive families were almost as dysfunctional as my own, and many of them did this solely for the money they received for my maintenance. I saw all kinds of bullying, physical and sexual abuse, and just plain neglect. The worst cases were families with several adopted children and their own children. In such families, a two-tier standard of care definitely thrives with preference given to natural children. Those years of my life were chaotic, to say the least, and I was rapidly approaching complete dysfunction when Gunny and Mrs. H got involved. I first met Gunny Hopkins in my first grade gym class. He is an African-American retired Marine sergeant with a second career as a high school physical education teacher. When I first met him, he was probably about 40 years old. Meeting him is unforgettable. He is about 93 meters tall and weighs almost 109 kilograms. If there's an ounce of fat on his body, it's well hidden. He scared the crap out of all the boys at school, not least because after school he made money by owning and running a dojo in a shopping center next to the school. Several people I met trained with him, and they said he had trophies from martial arts tournaments hanging on his wall, even though he no longer competes. No one I met at school had even a passing thought about upsetting him. Mrs. Hopkins was the school psychologist and was in charge of new students. Her height was about 1 meter 57, and her weight probably did not exceed 50 kilograms. She played Gunny Hopkins any way she wanted. Only later did I find out that they had three children, two boys, and a girl. The boys are marine officers, and the girl was still in college with a degree in early childhood education. I later learned that no matter how terrifying Gunny Hopkins was, he couldn't handle Mrs. X when she got wound up. When that happened, she became a freaking force of nature. I also subsequently learned that Gunny and Mrs. X qualified as foster parents as a result of their care for a niece whose parents were dependent and lost custody of her. 
They successfully completed her upbringing, and now her niece is married to a marine sergeant and has two children. I entered my last foster family a few weeks before the start of my freshman year of high school. The one where I was sent to be raised was not one of the best. The father is an alcoholic, quick-tempered, and quick to lose his temper to adopted children, and had just left the family, and they depended on the monthly income for these children to make ends meet between alcohol, a short temper, financial difficulties, and the lack of time for me to adapt to new living conditions. I expected trouble. This happened about two weeks after I started high school due to an unstable history with adoptive families. I fell far behind my peers academically on my first high school exam. I scored like a fifth grader in reading and like a fourth grader in math. This guaranteed that I would meet Mrs. X soon after I arrived at her school. The purpose of the meeting was to create an individual allies training plan to bring me up to grade level. But everything turned out to be much more complicated. On the morning of the meeting with Mrs. X, my adoptive father lost his temper with me. He lost his wallet and accused me of stealing it. When I couldn't produce it, he beat me, leaving me with bruises from my shoulders to my waist, a broken lower lip, and a black eye. I managed to escape and went to school expecting a normal day. I either forgot or didn't know about the meeting with Mrs. X when the teacher told me to report to the management instead of the first lesson. I walked down the corridor and entered her office. The next 30 minutes completely changed my life. I've done so many new student orientations that I could tell both sides of the conversation. As a foster child at a new school, I was used to a quick interview and immediate relegation to hopeless. Not worth the time. Perhaps it's cynical of me, but the last thing I expected when I walked through her door was that Mrs. X would actually care about me. I sat down in the chair, turning it so as to hide the side of my face where my adoptive father had hit me. She started our conversation by asking me to look at her, seeing my face. She gasped. What happened to you? I was well aware of the need to hide the shortcomings of an adoptive family, so I answered fell nonsense. These injuries cannot be the result of a fall. Do not lie to me. If you don't tell me who hit you, I'll call the police. I hesitated. She stared at me, picked up the phone, pressed 9 for an outside line, dialed 9 and swiped the third button, ready to end the 911 call I blurted out. My adoptive father thought I stole his wallet. He was drunk and lost his temper. Did he hit you anywhere else? Hit me on the back. It hurts a lot. Get up and turn around. I did as she asked. Pick up your shirt. I lifted my t-shirt up to my shoulders. Good God. How often does he do this to you? This is the first time I've only been there for a couple of weeks. Sit down. I need to make some calls. To my surprise, her first call was not to the director, the police, or CPS. She called her husband, George. You must come to my office immediately. That was the first sign of how much control she had over Gunny. Gunny X arrived moments later. She told him what she saw and then asked, What are we going to do about it? Gunny was no fool and had known his wife for a long time. She clearly has something on her mind. What do you want? I think he already understood what would happen next. This child needs a new foster family today. We are qualified and have three bedrooms available. If you don't mind, I'll call CPS and ask them to move him today. Danny nodded silently in agreement, and then stood behind me while his wife called CPS. The conversation was tough. I have never seen a petite woman radiate such power as she did during this call. She did not ask the CIA's employees she dealt with. She told them what they should do and told them they had to do it immediately. I have never seen such responsiveness in CFS. I couldn't believe this would happen, to my amazement. It happened. Having finished the conversation, she looked at her husband and said, We need to take the child's clothes and other belongings from that house. We'll go there after school. Turning to me, she said, Meet me here after your last lesson. We'll take your things. Turning to her husband, she said, George, take one of your cop buddies from the dojo with you. We need him to make sure things don't get out of hand. I looked at Gunny and could not imagine how my new adoptive father could cause him even the slightest trouble. But he remained silent, not wanting to look into the mouth of a gift horse. If Mrs. pulls this off, my life will change dramatically for the better. Don't screw it up by opening your mouth. I said to myself, Mrs. X sent me back to class, telling me that we would meet later to discuss my individual education plan. 
The day went as usual. I received a couple of comments regarding facial injuries. But other than that, it was a pretty standard school day. When it ended, I went to my locker, grabbed my things to go home, and reported to Mrs. X's office as instructed. Gunny X and an equally burly cop were already waiting for me there. The move couldn't have gone more smoothly. The intimidation factor prevented my adoptive father from expressing the slightest objection to my departure. I packed up my limited wardrobe and a couple of other things I had and put them in Gunny. His car. He drove me to his house, helped me unload and put me up in an empty bedroom. I didn't know it then, but the next four years would make me a completely new person. Life with Gunny and Mrs. X was radically different from all my previous experiences raising stepchildren. They became the first people to take care of me after my grandmother. From day one, they made it clear that I was expected to be organized, hard work, and disciplined. Mrs. X devoted her evenings to bringing my grades up to elementary school levels by the time I was 18. I was taking college preparatory courses and doing well in them. I would never graduate with the highest GPA, but I could hold my own in every class I took. A's and B's were expected of me. Anything lower meant extra hours of study, and Gunny X put me through an equally vigorous physical training program. Every morning he got me out of bed at 5.30 for a five-mile run, and he took it upon himself to provide a rigorous martial arts training program, which he combined with strength and flexibility training. By the time I graduated from high school, I was 5 foot 8 tall, 73 kilograms in weight, and in the best shape of anyone I knew. With the exception of Gunny H., shortly before I graduated from high school, I turned 18, which meant I was out of the foster care system. I worked part-time at a martial arts studio training elementary school age students. After the graduation party, Gunny sat me down next to him and asked me what my plans were for the future. I replied that I wanted to become a Marine. He asked if I was sure about this, since at that time the fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan was at its peak. I replied that I was sure he and Mrs. X drove me to the Marine Corps recruiter's office where I signed up. I had a month left before I was sent to Paris Island a boot camp. Gunny X put me through an even more rigorous training program than what I had previously undergone so that I would not embarrass him in front of his buddies. Who were the drill instructors there? I would never have told the inspector this, but after four years of living with the Hopkins and training with Gunny X, Paris Island was almost like a vacation. I graduated with honors carrying the company pennant in the graduation parade. Gunny and Mrs. X were standing on the podium watching me. By this time, I considered them my parents, and was proud to show how well they raised me. When I enlisted, I intended to make a career in the Marines, but that idea was put to rest by the Taliban with RPGs. My first tour of duty was coming to an end, and I was promoted to sergeant. I was a security squad leader providing protection to our battalion commander when he met with one of the local village chiefs about funding a water purification project in their village. On the way back to base, the convoy was attacked. My squad was traveling in the lead car. The battalion commander and three of his employees were in the middle, and another squad from my platoon covered the rear. The Taliban must have been watching the convoy when we left the village because they hit the middle car with an RPG, not mine. It caught fire. I dismounted, positioned my squad around the perimeter, and ordered him to open fire on the attacking force. When these forces got involved in battle, I ran to the middle car and began to pull the wounded out of it. The first person I got hold of was the battalion commander. I pulled out two of his subordinates and was about to return for another. When the fuel tanks of the car exploded due to the body armor and helmet, my legs took the brunt of the flames, leaving some interesting scars on them that ensured that I wouldn't have to wear shorts in public very often. The force of the explosion also threw me into a low wall, causing me to lose consciousness, break several ribs, and shatter both bones in my lower right leg. When I came to my senses, I was flying on an ambulance plane to a hospital in Germany. When my leg healed, the Marines gave me a navy cross, a purple heart, a set of plates and pins to hold the leg bones together, and gave me a medical discharge with a 40% disability rating. They paid for my return trip to my home, which was Gunny and Mrs. X's house, the place we all considered home. Upon returning home, Mrs. X asked what I planned to do with the rest of my life. 
I was 22 years old, trained to be a marksman, could teach martial arts, but had no real skills that could be applied to the job market. To her surprise, as I said, I wanted to go to college and become a high school history teacher. When I enlisted in the army, Gunny forced me to put a huge portion of my monthly salary into a college fund. So between those funds, GI Bill benefits, and a disability pension, college was within my means. An hour's drive from the Hopkins home was a decent state college with an excellent history program and a well-rounded education department. Mrs. X helped me apply since I was 22 and had been living on my own for four years. I rented a small apartment 15 minutes away from campus. Rather than think about living in a dorm with a bunch of college students, I registered as a double major in history and education and began skipping required prerequisite courses, one of which was a freshman biology course that included a weekly three-hour laboratory course. Since I didn't live in a dorm, didn't participate in Greek life or played sports, I didn't know anyone in my biology class. The teacher said that we should choose a laboratory partner since I was not an ordinary 18-year-old student. No one was attracted to me. When the teacher asked at the end of the hour, who didn't have a partner? Only one hand went up. She was a rather attractive woman, sitting a few rows ahead of me. The teacher told us to team up, exchange contact information, and leave the class. I walked down the central aisle and introduced myself to the woman. Hello, I'm David there. She stared at me silently, and I continued. If we want to become laboratory partners, we need to exchange contact information. If you give me your name and phone number, I will give you my information. She continued to watch Ms. We need to do this. Please, I don't bite, and I promise not to share this with anyone. Finally, she said, My name is Vera McDonald. The phone number is 5555551. Then she gave her email address. I did the same, then told her I'd see her in the lab and headed off to my next class. Faith turned out to be quite strange. She had the highest and thickest walls around her that I have ever seen in a person. Getting to know her was like trying to chisel granite with a plastic spoon. We went through almost the entire semester, and she still hadn't revealed a single fact about herself. Even though we spent three hours a week together in the biology lab, I tried unsuccessfully to make a hole in these walls, and finally just gave up, when it became clear that it would never open. Then, just before Thanksgiving break, I was talking to one of the guys in the nearby lab set up about our plans, when Vera walked in on us. "'What are you doing on vacation?' he asked. "'I'll spend most of the holidays in my apartment trying to prepare for the next semester.' Maybe I'll go to my foster parents for Thanksgiving and then come back here. They live about an hour away, and I haven't seen them since school started. Vera stopped abruptly when I mentioned adoptive parents. She looked at me and asked, Are you also an adopted child? Suddenly, everything fell into place. I knew what a challenging foster care was for me, and I was lucky that I was a man and ended up with Hopkins. I have seen some of the horrors inflicted on female adopted children, especially attractive ones. Vera tried to hide it with the baggy clothes she usually wore, but I noticed that she was a pretty girl. If it weren't for the wall she built, I would have already asked her out, since this was the first time she had opened even the smallest crack in her armor. I moved carefully. I was in a foster family from the age of 6 to 18. She was in 13 foster families. He lived in the latter for four years. I consider Gunny and Mrs. Hopkins to be my parents, even though they never adopted. Vera said I ended up in a foster family at the age of two. My father disappeared, and my mother died of cancer. I had no relatives who were ready to take me in. The experience was not the most pleasant. I was bouncing around like a pinball. I was lucky to get out of the system and not end up in jail. Luckily, I had teachers who looked out for me and a good social worker. Thanks to them, I received a scholarship that allowed me to study here. I'm studying accounting. I plan to find a job that will provide me with the most financial security I can get with an accounting degree. I believe that the world always needs accountants, so I will not have a shortage of work. Good plan, I replied. I specialize in history and education. Gunny acts as a school teacher, and Mrs. AX is a school guidance counselor. They rescued me from a very bad foster home and fixed the situation. 
After high school, I served in the Marines for four years, so now I'm just a freshman. We continued talking, returning to our lab work. When we finished work, I asked Vera, Do you want to go get something to eat? Personally, I'm dying of hunger. My budget does not allow me to eat anywhere other than a canteen. Okay. At my expense. No pressure. But let me do it like one stepchild to another. I have the means. You will be able to reciprocate when you get better. And with this, Vera entered my life as something different from a laboratory partner. I spent the rest of the semester working on getting Vera to open up to me. We didn't go on dates, but we became study buddies, spending a lot of time in the library together. I learned to cook from Mrs. X, so I invited Vera to dinner at home at least twice a week. We attended several college sporting events together, and I took her out to dinner one night. During all this time, I never touched her except to help her take off or put on her coat because of Hopkins' schedule. I had very little time to date during high school. I dated some people in the Marine Corps, but it was more of a hookup than anything resembling a relationship. So I didn't have much relationship skills to fall back on. It was obvious that Vera did too, even though it had become more open to some extent. There was always a barrier that prevented me from truly getting inside the stronghold. I saw that she was driven by the need to feel safe financially, physically, and emotionally. She had no intention of letting anyone in who might compromise that security. Getting her to the point where we could have a real relationship was not easy. But despite this, perhaps because I understood why she was like this, I kept trying. I found myself falling in love with her, as stupid as it may sound. The Christmas holidays completely changed our entire lives, turning us from friends into lovers. At Christmas, the college closed completely for three weeks, starting the week before the holiday and ending the week after the new year. I didn't think about what Vera would do during the holidays until she knocked on my door with a trash bag full of her things. Davy, she said, can I stay with you during the Christmas holidays? The hostel is closing tonight, and I don't have money for a hotel. Crap, I thought, what an idiot I am. Vera has nowhere to go on vacation. It was I who should have asked her to live with me. I'm a fool. Of course, I answered. Let me put clean linen on the bed. You can sleep there. I'll sleep here on the couch. I've done this many times before when I fell asleep in front of the TV. I'll get you some towels and a washcloth now. I'm not going to force you out of your own bed. We can share it. I trust that you won't try to take advantage of me. After all, we are both adopted children and have probably shared a bed with others before. Vera is right. Although it has been a long time since I shared a bed with anyone other than someone who was an easily accessible girl, and they haven't been for almost a year since I recovered from my injuries and started my first semester of college. But if she is ready, then I am ready. Who knows? I said to myself, maybe we can be more than just friends. I helped her move her things into my bedroom, cleared out a drawer and some closet space for her clothes, and invited her to Davy's world. Our first night was a little awkward. I was used to sprawling across the entire double bed. But this didn't work with Vera. I don't have pajamas, and usually sleep in boxers and a t-shirt. That didn't work either. So I went to bed wearing sweatpants over my boxers. Vera apparently believed in my restraint because she jumped out of the bathroom in a t-shirt and two small shorts from the way it bounced under the t-shirt. It was clear that there was nothing underneath. I was excited even before she lay down on the bed. I did my best. I really tried. I started the night by moving to the edge of the bed and turning away from Vera. I don't know when and how it happened, but by morning I turned over on the other side and lay with her like a spoon, wrapping my arms around her pressing her to me, and placing my palm on her chest. When I woke up, I was very excited, and Vera noticed it. Obviously, Vera woke up a long time ago. I'm so sorry. I told her I didn't want to be a pervert. Vera laughed. Don't worry. I feel good when someone snuggles up to me. I don't think I've ever just cuddled with someone before. I can get used to this. And with that, she rolled over, wrapped her arms around me, and kissed me. Morning breath and all. I was not ready for this, or what followed, without even saying, with your permission. Vera sat up and pulled her t-shirt over her head, throwing it on the floor next to her. She then rolled onto me and resumed our kiss. 
pushing her tongue into my mouth. I was tempted. That is, I really, really wanted to follow her. But at the last moment, virtue took precedence over vice. I pushed her away and said, Vera, you don't have to do this. I am your friend. I don't want you to pay me for the opportunity to spend the night by sleeping with me. I won't do this if you're not in the mood for a serious relationship. I'm not going to ruin our friendship over a quickie. I really like you. I'd like us to be more than just friends. But we won't become fudge buddies. Or one night stands. You mean too much to me. For us to do something like that. From my time in foster care, I knew that many foster children, especially girls, viewed love as an extended form of a handshake. Something that gave them the opportunity to get what they wanted. Or, as a way of saying thank you to someone who I did something for them. It could mean absolutely nothing. Just be a way to earn points or get out of trouble. Spending time with Gunny and Mrs. X made me look at it from a different perspective. I saw that these two had a fulfilling, loving relationship, and I wanted to have the same for myself. In my imagination, I began to imagine Vera as the second person in this relationship. No matter how stupid it was, I don't think anyone has ever said no to Vera when asked to have love. I had no idea how long she had been sexually active, but I was sure that she had not dated anyone since the beginning of her studies. As far as I could tell, I was her only friend on campus. The only reason she allowed me inside the walls she built was our shared past as an adopted child. Vera looked at me for a long time. Then she said, Davy, sometimes you're too nice for your own good. Here I am offering you a chance to enjoy me. But you refuse. Are you serious? It's not easy for me to do this. I really like you. I might even be a little in love with you. I fanatically dream of being with you. But until you feel for me the same way I feel for you, the answer will be no. And if I say that I'm also a little in love with you, will you do it? Only if I believe that you are honest with me and not just trying to make me feel good. You are unbearable, Davy. Dare with these words. She got out of bed, took her t-shirt, and after changing, went to the bathroom to take a shower and brush your teeth. When she finished, I did the same until the end of the day. Relations between us were cool that night. Instead of a t-shirt and shorts, Vera went to bed in a tracksuit. There was still nothing underneath, as far as I could tell, but I think she was trying to say something. The next morning, I went for a run, taking my phone with me. When I finished, I called Mrs. H. Hello, Mrs. H. Are we still going to Christmas dinner? Of course, Davy. Why are you even asking? I know it's rude, but maybe there's room for one more at the table. My biology partner is a foster child and has nowhere to go for Christmas. She will live with me during the holidays because the dorms are closed. I wouldn't want to leave her alone at Christmas. The more the merrier. Take her with you. We will make sure she enjoys a good dinner and time with our family. Thank you, Mrs. H. Can we bring anything? Just the two of you. See you. Bye. Later that day, I went for pizza. On the way, I stopped at a local jewelry store and bought a small necklace with a tiny figurine dangling from a chain. Since Vera will be joining the Hopkins clan for Christmas, I wanted to make sure she had a gift to open. I didn't know it then, but this necklace would be the first Christmas gift she would receive that wasn't from a foster care agency or charity. The gift in the form of a necklace was the impetus that turned Vera and I's relationship from friendship to love. When I gave her the gift, she opened it and then burst into tears. And then in front of everyone, she jumped onto my lap and kissed me like she had never kissed me before. When we got back to my apartment that evening, she pulled me into the bedroom and told me she wanted us to be in a relationship. It took a year and a half for me. I don't know how long for her, but we quickly proved that good love comes from the heart, not the groin. Vera never moved back to the dorm when the dorm reopened. We moved all her things into my apartment and started living together. I'm not sure Gunny and Mrs. X were entirely on board with us getting together. They had doubts about how quickly we moved from working in the laboratory to living together but they were happy for us and accepted Vera as part of the family. The next three and a half years flew by. Vera made impressive progress in her accounting studies, graduated top of her class, and landed an amazing job at a big four accounting firm in Philadelphia. 
I was able to find a teaching position at a suburban high school where I taught history to 9th and 10th graders. Soon after finishing school, we got married. Small wedding. Gunny H. was the best man, and Mrs. H. was the bridesmaid at the reception. Gunny H. gave me a card. When I opened it, there was a check for all the custody payments that he and Mrs. X. received for my support. We used this money to buy a small house next to the SEPTA rail line into the city, allowing Vera to commute by rail. Her work hours were much longer than mine, and she had to travel regularly to check on clients. But we were almost deliriously happy for the first time since we met. Vera seemed settled, confident in our relationship and where she was in her life. We had been married about four and a half years when Vera's firm was retained by the U.S. government to audit a major defense contractor accused by an anonymous whistleblower of massive billing fraud on a cost-plus contract. The contractor allegedly falsified hundreds of millions, perhaps even $1,000,000 in expenses, with payments pocketed by a select group of executives. The whistleblower alleged the contractor was located in the Midwest and Vera. His team conducted the audit for weeks, seven days a week. She left on Sunday evening and was away for two or three weeks, then returned home, recuperated for a week, and left again. She got into the habit of giving me a wild evening of love before each trip, and an equally wild evening upon her return. While she was gone, we talked every day, had phone love. If she was alone in her room or office, or just chatted if others were around. It wasn't perfect, but Vera enjoyed working on such an important project, and the feedback from her bosses was overwhelmingly positive. This was the kind of project that could lead her to a partnership sooner rather than later. The informant was an accountant named Richard Wilson, about 30 years old. He was a mid-level employee responsible, primarily for accounting and billing under a cost-plus contract when he came across payments to an unknown subcontractor. When he retrieved a copy of the contract from the database, he discovered that the invoices were for services that duplicated those of another subcontractor. Being a methodical man, he dug deeper and found out that the fake contractor belonged to a corporation from the Cayman Islands with the help of a friend who was extremely tech-savvy. He hacked into the computers of the law firm that established the parent corporation in the Cayman Islands and discovered that it was owned by four top executives of a defense contractor. So he hired a lawyer and filed a lawsuit against the defense contractor. All heck broke loose. Vera spent several days with Richard on each trip, keeping track of all bills and payments. If the claim of violation of the law was confirmed, he was entitled to an eight- or nine-figure payout, which ultimately happened. I didn't know then that Richard was seriously interested in Vera, and when Vera realized that a huge reward awaited Richard at the end of his investigation, she began to think that he offered a much more secure future than the one we have. It is impossible to inflate a case of this magnitude without making enemies, and Richard made many of them. Unfortunately for him, and ultimately for me, some of them decided to solve their problem by eliminating the source. After the third unsuccessful attempt on his life, the feds decided that it was time to take Richard under protection. Richard agreed, but set one condition. He wanted Vera to go with him. Sometimes the husband is indeed the last to know about everything. It was only many years later that I learned what was in Vera's mind when she agreed to accompany Richard into the witness protection program. It wasn't about the money, per se, but rather the security that that money provided, coupled with the oversight and protection of the U.S. Marshal Service. Vera's self-doubt, caused by her childhood in foster care, overcame any remorse she might have felt about leaving me. The day of Vera's disappearance began like any other, with her leaving to continue her audit. The night before, we had wild monkey love for several hours. It was as if she was trying to satiate me for a long time, our lovemaking was even more intense than the usual farewell love we had had before our previous trips. We were talking about having a baby, and Vera stopped taking birth control pills shortly before her previous trip. I attributed the extra fervor of our lovemaking to her trying to get pregnant before the trip. The next morning, she took the train to the office with her suitcases and briefcase, and I went to school. That was the last time I saw or spoke to her. Later, 
Surveillance cameras in front of Vera's office will show her leaving the office as if heading to the airport. She was picked up and driven away by a black SUV with temporary license plates. When I didn't hear from her for several days, I became worried. Phone calls went to voicemail. Emails remained unopened. The SMS did not elicit a response. This has never happened before. I was very worried that something had happened. Finally, I called Vera's office to find out what happened. They told me she was on vacation. On holiday? Can't be. She made it clear that she was flying to the Midwest after a full day of work. Have you heard from her? No. It was not then mad with worry. I reported Vera missing. The local police were understanding, but weren't sure my fears were justified. After all, Vera is an adult. Did we quarrel? Does she have a lover? She may have lost her phone? Or maybe she's just too busy to communicate with her worried husband? When it became clear that her phone was dead, her laptop was untraceable. Her credit cards weren't being used, and our bank accounts were untouched. The cops finally started taking me more seriously. Vera's employer handed over recordings from surveillance cameras near the office, which showed Vera getting into an SUV. The temporary numbers turned out to be fake. There were no such things. Now the police have begun a more thorough investigation. They interrogated me for several hours before they were convinced that at the moment Vera got into the car. I was at an after-school meeting with ten other teachers. They searched our entire house, looked into our finances, and concluded that there was no sign of what happened to my wife. She simply disappeared from the face of the earth as if she had disappeared into thin air. I'm completely lost. Although I realized early in our marriage that Vera's feelings for me might never reach the same level as mine for her, I was confident that she loved me to the best of her ability. Given the limitations imposed by her extensive experience of a child living in a foster family, I couldn't believe that Vera just left me. She took nothing that mattered to her except my first Christmas present, a necklace that she never took off, even though she wore other jewelry. Increasingly convinced that something terrible had happened to her, I began to drink to numb the pain. The school district gave me a leave of absence to come to terms with the loss, and the school year was almost over. So I had the whole summer to recover from the loss, or I will have time to regularly drink myself into a stupor. I chose the latter. When Vera first disappeared, I communicated with Hopkins's daily. As time passed, said, and there was no sign of what had happened to here. Contact became less frequent as I continued my downward spiral. My contacts became increasingly sporadic. By the end of July that summer, I had not spoken to either Hopkins for almost a month. Mrs. X was worried, so she did what she did best when she was worried. She sent Gunny to see how I was doing the night before. I drank about a bottle of Jack Daniels and was already passed out on the couch when Gunny appeared. First he rang the doorbell, which I didn't pay attention to. Then he knocked. When I didn't answer, he started banging on the door and shouting, Screwing Maureen, open the darn door now. I was amazed, and even a little scared. In all the years I knew him, I never heard him raise his voice or swear. I did the only thing possible. I opened the door. Gunny looked around my living room and asked, What on earth happened here? The question was reasonable. Both the living room and kitchen were a pile of dirty dishes, boxes of food, and empty liquor bottles. I haven't showered, shaved, or changed clothes for at least a week. You stink. Quickly up. Gunny dragged me up the stairs and threw me into the shower. Still fully dressed. Take off this dirty crap and clean yourself up while I was showering. Gunny called Mrs. H. He's drunk. He's dirty. He's turned the house into a pigsty. And he needs R again. A couple of people came here and let them clean up this mess. I'll gather some clothes for him and drag him over to us as soon as he takes a shower. Mrs. X agreed, and Gunny X hung up and began packing my clothes into a duffel bag. The second rescue of David Dare from the Hopkins began. When we arrived at the Hopkins house, Gunny H threw my things in the bedroom I had used as a foster child and then stared at me. You're not like that. We've spent too much time and effort on you to let you fall apart. You've made too much progress to crash and burn now. This crap stops right now. Tomorrow I will wake up at 5.30. We'll start all over again with you. After that, he closed the door. The next morning was excruciating, to say the least. Since Vera's disappearance, I have not run or done any exercise. 
Gunny X went on a five-mile run at a pace that would have been difficult for me to maintain on a good day. And this day was clearly not a good day. When we finished our run, he loaded me into his truck and drove me to the dojo, where we did exercises and stretching for an hour before sparring. By the time we finished, all the drink had been squeezed out of me, and I was completely exhausted. This set the tone for the rest of the summer. By the time the school year started, I was back in shape, and my head was mostly in the right place. The district has a good employee assistance plan, and Mrs. X signed me up for counseling twice a week. By Christmas, I was the same again, except for the hole in my heart where Vera had once settled. Pennsylvania law required Vera to be missing for seven years before I could declare her dead. Luckily for me, Vera's overwhelming need for financial security led us to buy a house that we could afford solely on my salary and disability pension. She also divided her salary to maximize our retirement fund, make double to pay off the mortgage, and save the rest. Financially, I was fine, except that I couldn't sell my house car or access her retirement funds. However, I was in good enough financial shape to not need a second income, although I was again working part-time as a studio trainer in addition to teaching. On a warm June day, just before the end of the school year, a little more than five years after Vera disappeared, I heard the doorbell ring. When I opened it, I found a man and a woman dressed in business casual attire, one of them holding an accordion folder. They both showed their identification and then identified themselves as Deputy U.S. Marshals, Simpson and Wallach. How can I help you? I asked the question, was a dead giveaway because I had no idea what could possibly bring two U.S. Marshals to my front door. Maybe they were in the wrong house. They asked if I was David there, and if I was the husband of Vera Dare. My heart sank. Have they finally found Vera? Or most likely, her remains. I confirmed that I was the same David Dare, and invited them in, sitting them down in the living room, and asking if I could offer them something to drink, or just water. They refused. I asked why they were here. They began to tell me a story that seemed incomprehensible to me while I took the initiative. Mr. Dare, we owe you a huge apology. Five years ago, the Marshal Service screwed up. We are here to ask for forgiveness and try to correct this mistake. Now, I was completely confused, she continued. Five years ago, the Marshal Service accepted the informant, you know, as Richard Wilson, into the Witness Protection Program. He discovered and reported on one of the largest defense procurement frauds in U.S. history. Your wife was part of a team of auditors. The government brought in to audit the defense contractor involved and track the funds. I pointed out that I was familiar with this because this was the case that Vera was working on when she disappeared. Apparently, your wife and Mr. Wilson began a relationship, and he insisted that she go into the witness protection program with him. She agreed. But before that... She insisted that everything possible be done to make her disappearance from your life as easy as possible. Specifically, a divorce petition was drawn up and signed transferring to you all of the marital assets and all of her personal assets. A quitclaim deed for your home was signed. A deed for the transfer of her car was signed, and other property transfer documents were signed. She also enclosed a letter addressed to you. All this was to be delivered to you as soon as she and Mr. Wilson were safely moved in. Now I started to get angry. Are you saying that my wife, whom I mourned for five years, ran off with some guy she met during an audit? Did you know about this and didn't report it? Local cops still have an open file on the case. They have been spinning their wheels for five years, and I have been in mourning for the same amount of time. I cannot believe it. While it continued, we are sincerely sorry. This folder should have been delivered to you a long time ago. We only found it when we went back to our records after Mr. Wilson and your wife were killed. Killed? Are you saying that my wife is now dead? Yes, it is. They were moved to Portland, Oregon, after Mr. Wilson received his whistleblower payment. They lived there quietly until about two months ago. There was a home invasion, and Mr. Wilson was killed. Your wife was seriously injured and fell into a coma after Mr. Wilson's death. She lived about 35 days since. She outlived him by more than 30 days. All his property went to her. Your daughter and their second child were unharmed and are in our care. We didn't want to tell you about this or make it public until we confirmed that Vera and Richard's deaths were not related to the informant's case. 
but Portland police just arrested the home invaders using surveillance footage, so we know who they are. They are just bandits, not professionals hired to eliminate Vera and Richard. It was a pure accident, in no way connected with his denunciation. Just a minute. Daughter. I don't have a daughter. Vera and I did not have children. No, they were. Vera was pregnant with your child before she entered the witness protection program. Your daughter is about four and a half years old. Her little brother is two. How do you know that the girl is mine? After the birth of the girl, Vera conducted a DNA test. She didn't look anything like Wilson. And Vera thought there was a possibility that she had been conceived. The last time you were together. It turned out she was right. She gave the DNA test result to her lawyer to keep with her will. She had enough confidence in your relationship to appoint you as the guardian of both children. If something happened to her and Richard, she also named you as the individual trustee of the trust created for the children. The second trustee is their bank. This trust is currently valued at over $100 million. You are also listed as a beneficiary of Vera's $5 million estate, provided you agree to take custody of both children and raise them as your own. In addition, she indicated that you would receive the necklace that she wore constantly and which you should save for Violet until her marriage and give it to her as a wedding gift from her mother. There's something else you need to know. Although we relocated Richard and Vera with ID as husband and wife, her marriage to you was not dissolved because you did not file a petition for divorce or declare Vera dead. Legally, you are still her husband, or at least you were until she died a few days ago. This means we can hand Violet over to you immediately. There are more problems with Samuel. We are creating a backup birth certificate for him. Once we receive it, we can transfer it to Violet at the same time without you having to go through the entire background check process of the adoptive parents. We will replace Mr. Wilson's name as the father with yours on both certificates and transfer the children to you. What do you think? What will I say? Are you kidding me? Excuse my French. You barge into my house unannounced. Tell me that my missing wife lived with some guy under another guise for five years and just died. That I have a daughter I've never seen. Who also has a half-brother. That these kids are rich beyond belief, and that you want me to take custody of both of them. Do you even hear what you are saying? Some people in this room are crazy, and I don't think one of them is me. As embarrassing as it is to admit, it's all true. We would like to make an appointment with the Marshal's Service to release the children to you and connect you with a probate law firm. We would be grateful if you would keep this a secret until all formalities have been completed. We understand that we made some huge mistakes in the way things were done, and we are very embarrassed and we regret it. We promise heads will roll for this. But now the most important thing is taking care of the children. So are you in or not? As far as we can tell, Richard and Vera have no other relatives. If you don't take these children, they will end up in some kind of foster care. It was a low blow. I suspected that both marshals were well aware that both Vera and I were adopted children and decided to play their trump card. Do as we ask. Or two small children will end up in a system you hate. Once they played that card, I had no choice. I agree. When can I meet the children? The marshals left a folder with documents that Vera asked the marshal service to prepare when she disappeared. I put it on the table in my office, deciding that five years had already passed, so whatever was there would last a few more days. After the meeting with the marshals ended, I called Hopkins. Without going into details, I told them that federal law enforcement had contacted me, that Vera was dead, and that she had two children left for whom I would now have to become the parent. I'll pass on the details to both Funny and Mrs. H. Never asked me if I was crazy. They just started helping me plan to buy everything I'd need for my new role as a single dad. Two days later, at a meeting at the federal courthouse in Philadelphia, Violet and Samuel were handed over to me, receiving birth certificates, naming them as my children. Now, I am officially their father, completely unprepared, confused, sad, and angry, but still a father being younger. Samuel took to me almost immediately. It took Violet a few more weeks, but by the time the school year started in the fall, they both started calling me dad. I enrolled Violet and Samuel in a daycare center close to the school that most teachers with small children used. 
Hopkins used their extensive list of contacts to find me a pediatrician, reputable babysitters, and other resources needed by a new father. I think they saw Violet and Samuel as two more grandchildren, just as they saw me as a son, even if not officially adopted. The folder sat on my desk for a month before I finally opened it. One evening, after putting the kids to bed in it, I found all the documents the marshals were talking about, as well as Vera's engagement and wedding rings and ten copies of her death certificate, which I would need to close the various accounts and transfer her retirement funds to individual retirement account. The necklace I gave her that first Christmas together was still there. After Vera's death, the marshals took her personal belongings from the hospital and did not fail to add them to the materials that they gave to me. I looked at the envelope with Vera's last letter for a long time before opening it. I wasn't sure. I wanted to know what she was thinking when she left me. Finally, I made up my mind, opened the envelope, and began to read. Dear Davy, by the time you receive this letter, I will already be gone. I'm sorry for doing this to you, but I tried to make the process of my disappearance as simple as possible. Attached to this letter are all the documents you will need to erase me from your life. And move on without me. I know this will hurt you. For this, I can only express my deepest regret. You loved me unconditionally, and I will always cherish that. I wish I could do the same with you. I know myself well enough to understand that I have never loved anyone. I don't think I even have the capacity to love. After all the years I spent in this darn foster care system, I know that no one ever loved me until I met you, with the possible exception of my mother, about whom I remember nothing. You are much stronger than me because you survived the system while retaining the ability to love, but not me. Perhaps the difference is that Gunny and Mrs. X spent time with you. Or perhaps it is the fact that you are the best man I have ever known. By leaving with Richard, I had the opportunity to gain physical and economic security that you and I would never have had. As a former foster child, I'm sure you'll understand my point with it. We will have enormous funds and we will be under the protection of U.S. Marshals. Nothing you and I have can compare to this. I don't like Richard, and I think he knows it. But he loves me and is willing to take the risk that over time I will be able to love him especially if we have children together as we plan. So, my dear Davy, be angry. Hate me if you want. I don't expect you to ever forgive me for what I do. But I hope that you will look back on the insecurity of your own existence in foster care and understand why I made this decision. Please cut me out of your life and move on with your life. Forget about me. Treat me like I'm dead. If necessary, mourn me. But if not, I will understand why you cannot do this. There is a woman out there somewhere who can give you the same unconditional love that you gave to me, but that I was never able to give to you. I hope you find her, and you both can love and grow old together. I hope she gives you a house full of children and grandchildren, something I couldn't do for you. Farewell, my dear, dear Davy. Be healthy. Continue to live. May it be long, rich, and fulfilling faith. After reading the letter, I sat at the table for a long time and cried quietly. The paradox was almost overwhelming. She had fled to where she thought she would be safe, only to have a random act of violence destroy her. My tears were not caused by loss, but by the fact that a hellish system had caused irreparable damage to the woman I love so much, and whose childhood experiences had robbed her of the opportunity to ever truly love another person. Vera's death meant that now she would never have such an experience. I put the letter in the safe and went to bed. I will never understand why anyone would want to be a single parent. The good news is that by the time Violet and Samuel appeared in my life, they were no longer awake, every two hours. However, at the end of the day, I felt exhausted after teaching all day and then caring for them at night. Eventually, I used the funds. Vera left me to hire a full-time housekeeper, Nanny, a delightful 50-year-old Mexican immigrant named Maria, who immediately began teaching the children Spanish and showering them with love and affection as if she were their grandmother. By the time the children had lived with me for a year, we had become a family. The summer after the marshal's visit, I took the kids and Maria to Ocean City, New Jersey, for two weeks. 
He allowed Maria to spend a lot of time on herself, taking the children to the beach and embankment. We all great fun, and were very sorry that the holiday was over. At the time, Vera and I bought the house. My closest neighbors were over seventy. Early that summer, they told me they were putting their house on the market and moving to Texas to be closer to their daughter and grandchildren. The house sold quickly, and the deal took place while we were on the beach. I had not yet had a chance to meet my new neighbors when Violet came from the backyard with a request. Dad, can Teddy play in our playtown? Who is Teddy? New boy next door. Did his mom or dad allow him to come to us? I didn't see them. Well, let's go ask. It's still time to meet new neighbors, and this is a good reason. And so we went to the next house. I rang the doorbell, and after a short wait, an attractive 30-year-old brunette in paint-splattered jeans and an equally paint-splattered t-shirt answered. How can I help you? she asked. Hello, I said. I'm Davy Dare from next door. We just returned from the shore yesterday. Violet is my daughter and I also have a son, Samuel. They were playing on our playground, and your little one wanted to join them. I'd like to make sure you don't mind before I let him come. Hello? the woman said. I'm Carol Schick. I moved here a week ago and you caught me in the middle of painting my son Teddy's room. Are you sure you don't mind him playing with your children? No. Everything is okay. We'll keep him entertained and give you the chance to get on with painting without worrying about him. Let me give you my phone number, and you can call me whenever you want him to come home, or just come up and shout. I'll probably be in the backyard with the kids. After these words, she thanked me and left the house to tell Teddy that he could go to the neighbors to play with Violet and Samuel. The children communicated as if they had known each other forever. Carol must have lost track of time. It was already time for dinner, and there was no news from her. Violet and Samuel wanted Teddy to have dinner with them. I didn't have Carol's number yet, so I went next door again, rang the bell, and was greeted again by an even more paint-splattered woman. Hello again. I was going to feed my kids, and they wanted Teddy for dinner. If you don't mind, I'll feed them all, and you can join us if you want. Can you give me twenty minutes to get myself ready? I'll take a quick shower and put on clothes that aren't stained with paint. Twenty minutes later, my doorbell rang, and Carol appeared dressed in clean jeans and a man's shirt with the tails hanging down and the sleeves rolled up to the elbows. She had a bottle of red wine in her hands. Come in, children. In the kitchen. We'll have spaghetti and meatballs. I hope you don't mind. I prepared a salad for this dish, and I have garlic bread in the oven. This is amazing. Teddy loves spaghetti, although we'll probably have to hose him down when he's done. And I love pasta, too. Is your wife here? I wasn't going to share Vera's whole story with a woman I've known for about three hours. So I just said I'm a widower. My wife died a little over a year ago. Sorry, I know how much it hurts. My husband was a helicopter pilot in Iraq, killed in battle about two years ago. Now it's my turn to apologize. I spent two tours in the Middle East as a Marine. I lost several friends there. It hurts to lose anyone, but especially your spouse. The realization that my new neighbor was a widow made me take a closer look at her. The woman was pretty, maybe a year or two younger than me, with an attractive face and a nice body. She had a few extra pounds, but they were distributed mostly around her hips and chest, giving her an hourglass figure that I found quite sexy. Carol and I ended up talking for almost two hours. Once the kids were fed, we washed the dishes together, and then sat around the kitchen table with a glass of wine and learned more about each other. Carol works as a librarian and moved here to be closer to her parents, which allowed Teddy to have more contact with his grandparents, who could also provide additional assistance with childcare. I told Carol that I grew up in foster care and moved back to the area after serving in the Marines and attending college. Because my wife had been offered a great job at a big four accounting firm, I followed her because it was easier for me to get a teaching job in the area than it was for her to find a similar job elsewhere. In addition, my last adoptive parents, whom I consider my parents, live nearby. The kids were clearly starting to get tired, and we decided to call it a day. Before leaving, I told Carol about Maria and added that I would be happy to provide care for Teddy at any time if she needed someone for a short time. My teaching job keeps me free all summer, and during the school year, I usually get home by 4 p.m. 
Maria is usually here from 7 in the morning until I return home during the week. Carol seemed delighted by the offer since her schedule included working one evening a week until 8 p.m. Everything settled down. Carol and Teddy went home, and I proceeded to Bethy the kids and read stories before kissing Violette and Samuel goodnight. I felt a spark fly between me and Carol, but I was still coming to terms with the loss of Vera. I was not ready for a new relationship, especially considering how my marriage to Vera ended. But it had been five years since I had been with a woman, and signs of interest began to appear in my little head as the conversation with Carol continued. She showed no signs of such interest, but the loss of her husband was much more recent than the disappearance of Vera. I'll wait and see what happens next over the next few months. Carol's family and mine gradually began to merge. Teddy became a permanent fixture in our backyard and Violet's best friend in kindergarten. I stopped by them a few times to do some minor repairs that Carol couldn't handle. We ate dinner with the kids at least once a week, and on weekends we often spent a few hours together over a glass of wine watching the children play in my backyard. It was almost Christmas when I finally plucked up the courage to ask her out. I hoped I wasn't mistaken in the signals. I thought she was giving. We started spending more time together, driving to the kids' school events, and just hanging out. I didn't want to try to move what we had from friends to lovers, but I also knew that if I didn't ask, she would never have the chance to say yes. And I began to worry that if I didn't do something, someone else might sneak in and steal her affections. So one day, after walking Teddy home, after Carol had returned home, I plucked up the courage to ring her doorbell. Had just returned from the library and was still dressed in her business casual suit. She had the look of a sexy librarian, professional attire, blouse undone, a couple of buttons showing cleavage, hair pulled back into a tight bun, reading glasses hanging from a chain around her neck. Baby Dave immediately stood at attention, but luckily the jeans I was wearing were tight enough to hide my arousal. Hi, how are you? Was Teddy being good? He was great, as usual. He and Violet did their homework, and then all three children spent the rest of the time in the yard. I'm here because I wanted to ask you something cold. If I can find a babysitter or arrange for Maria to watch the kids on Saturday night, would you like to go out for dinner and watch a movie? I mean, an adults-only night. Just the two of us. Carol laughed. Well, she said, it's about time. I was starting to doubt that you would ever ask me out. I was going to give you until the Christmas holidays. And if you didn't step forward, I was going to you myself. Of course. I'd love to go on a date with you. We've been dancing around this for months now. What time should I be ready on Saturday? Let me make arrangements with the nanny, and I will contact you with these words. I wished her good night and almost floated across the lawn to my house. Maria was happy to work a little overtime, especially since she had been wanting me back in the dating pool for a long time. She met Carol and liked her, and she accepted Teddy as another grandson. After arranging for babysitting, I told Carol that I would pick her up at six in the evening. We'll go to a local Italian restaurant that I've been to many times before, and then we'll see a new movie at the local AMC knocking on her door. I was as nervous as a schoolboy on his first date. Carol opened the door. I froze, stunned. She was wearing a white blouse, almost transparent, which showed a lace bra that supported her beautiful chest. She was also pants that showed off her wide hips, and when she turned around, highlighted her very shapely butt. Wow. That's all I could say. She took my hand and followed me to the car. I opened the door for her and watched her get in, then closed the door and walked over to the driver's side. Finally, I regained my composure and said, My God, if I knew you looked so good, I wouldn't have waited so long. You look absolutely stunning in this outfit. Carol found this quite funny. You've been looking at my butt for months now. Don't think I didn't notice how you do it. And you, of course, look very attractive. Running and martial arts training seem to be working. The evening flew by unnoticed as we sat down in the theater. Carol took my hand and rested her head on my shoulder. Looked down at her, then tilted my head and kissed her. She answered enthusiastically. Luckily, we were sitting far back, so we weren't exposing ourselves to everyone. After the movie ended, we went to a local bar where a small jazz band was performing and spent an hour listening to music and talking. 
when they finally went home, they walked to the car with their arms around each other's waists. From my point of view, the evening was successful and exciting. I was sure Carol felt the same way because she asked me when we could do it again. I replied that as soon as we could plan another evening. Thus began the third salvation in my life. The one that finally gave me lasting, unconditional love, which Vera was never able to give. We were careful about how we behaved around the children, but when they were playing outside or sleeping, we acted like two high school students. We didn't actually sleep together, but we definitely spent a lot of time together. Finally, after two months of this behavior, I asked Maria if she could watch all three kids for the weekend, so Carol and I could go away together. We chose a romantic hotel in Lancaster County and left right after school on Friday night. We had dinner at a wonderful French restaurant in the heart of Lancaster, after which we went to the guest house and checked in. When we entered the room, Carol left the room with a small travel bag and headed to the bathroom. When she came out, I stood there stunned. She was wearing a garter belt and stockings, lace teddy underwear held together, and a bra that barely covered her chest and high heels. Little Davy almost unzipped the pants I was wearing, babbled. We spent most of the night making love despite my long break and her somewhat shorter one. Neither of us seemed to have forgotten how to please our partners. My memories of this evening are pure passion and pleasure. Either the walls of the boarding house have the best soundproofing I have ever seen, or the rooms next to us were empty because Carol was the loudest mistress, and the neighbors could have a very hard time sleeping. At some point, I thought that because of her sounds, someone definitely called the police. We fell asleep in each other's arms in the wee hours of the morning and slept until the maid woke us up to clean the room. The next evening, we made sure to put a Do Not Disturb sign on the door, which gave us the opportunity to have love the next morning before we checked out of the hotel. From that moment on, we became a couple. I took Carol and Teddy to meet the Hopkins, who both gave me a thumbs up. Carol's parents were equally approving. We spent every free moment together, and after we talked about our relationship with all three children, we began to spend nights together. By Memorial Day, I was convinced that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with Carol. After speaking with Carol's father and receiving his blessing, I got down on one knee in the restaurant where we had our first date and proposed her. Yes, sounded loud enough to make every head in the room turn. We were both already married, so neither of us saw the need for a wedding. We decided to have our ceremony outdoors at a local park and rent a pavilion for the reception with food. The guests were Carol's family, the Hopkins family, our children, Maria, and several good friends. Maria agreed to stay with the children for a week while we honeymooned at a resort in the Caribbean before our wedding. I sat Carol down and told her the whole Vieira story mentioned a generous bequest and the stipulation that I would raise Violet and Samuel told her about the trust for Violet and Samuel. He even explained the importance of the necklace he gave Vera that first Christmas. We discussed what to do with each other's children and decided that we would each adopt the other's children. We also talked about having one or more children of our own and agreed that we wanted at least one more. Shortly after their honeymoon, Carol discovered she was pregnant. Apparently one of the medications she was taking in preparation her trip to the Caribbean had reversed the effects of her birth control pills. She was worried that I would be upset about having a new baby while we were still getting used to life together. But I was over the moon. Nine months after the wedding, baby George David was born. He was followed two years later by Margaret, and... We stopped there. Carol took a leave of absence to raise her children while I continued teaching, with the last two additions to our family. We realized that neither house was large enough to serve as a place to raise five children. We bought a large Victorian house with a large yard just outside the city center and renovated it, selling both of our houses to finance the project. We moved into the house shortly after we found out we were expecting Margaret. Soon after the wedding, I discovered that Vera had left me one last gift. The gift was great. I hired a lawyer to prepare adoption petitions, as well as the usual wills and powers of attorney for me and Carol. When planning the distribution of the inheritance, I told him that I wanted Teddy to receive virtually all of Carol's estate and mine, since Violet and Samuel were generously provided for under the terms of the Vera Trust. He asked me for a copy of the trust documents so he could properly reference it in our wills, 
explaining why our assets were not distributed equally among the three children. He had the papers for several days when he called me. David, did you actually read the trust document? No, I haven't read it. The bank handles all matters with the money Vera left me. I didn't have to touch the trust funds for Violet and Samuel. I don't think I'll need these funds until the kids go to college. Why are you asking? Well, I was looking through the document and found a provision that might interest you. It may force Carol and you to change your estate plan. And what's there? I won't read everything, but the gist is that Vera added a clause to her trust about additional beneficiaries. If you end up raising Violet and Samuel, she provided that any children born adopted by you or stepchildren who were minors at the time of your marriage to their mother would be added as beneficiaries. Teddy is considered your stepson and will continue to be considered as such. After the adoption is finalized, any children you and Carol have will also benefit. This woman must have thought a lot about you to provide for your children in this way. I was stunned. The woman who told me she could never love me the way I deserved and encouraged me to move on without her most generously provided for the children she hoped I would have. She ensured that these children would never experience the lack of financial or physical security that she herself experienced as a child in foster care. I was stunned by how she cared about my well-being and the well-being of my children, even from her grave. Carol and I made the necessary adjustments to our estate plans. Thanks to Vera's generosity, our five children will never need for anything. I'm sitting on the porch of our house and watching our four older children play in the backyard. Carol curled up in my lap with her head on my shoulder and her arms wrapped around me. Margaret is fast asleep in her carrier. I reflect on how rich my life is and how lucky I am. I am grateful to Hopkins for rescuing me from a self-destructive spiral. Twice. I am even more grateful to my sexy, beautiful wife for saving me from life as a single parent. And I am grateful to Vera for her generous care of our five children. I still can't bring myself to forgive her completely, but I understand her motives. She is a product of a flawed system, but in the end, she managed to commit one last act that demonstrated, if not love, then at least recognition of my love for her.